Um, my name's Corey McLeod. I um, am here to talk about a virtual reality documentary called Pack Once, a VR documentary. And I'll just start off by showing you the trailer we created. Oh, do we not have audio do we have on this? audio through here? Um, are you yeah. in the HDMI? I'm in the HDMI. Sorry. Later, probably. I should have tested this out before. It's probably the volume here. Volume on here. How do you topple an oppressive, all-powerful, brutal regime? With rock and roll. <laughs> the Soviet Union did not just fall. It was pushed by a band from Latvia. The story of homemade guitars and synthesizers beating Soviet guns must be told. This is that story. I'm Corey McLeod. I'm a creative technologist at Fallon. Uh, Fallon's an advertising agency in Minneapolis um, that's traditionally known for doing uh, television work. So RVs is one of our clients. H&R Block um, was one of our clients. Uh, we did BMW Films. So we're not known for doing interactive work. And I got brought in three years ago as a creative technologist which is basically, um, you know, they recognized that there are some developers who feel equally comfortable in the world of coding and in the arts. So they created this sort of new sort of bucket to um, put these people, these advertising agencies, call them hybrids. And um, so I spend most of my day um, you know, uh, creating prototypes with Arduino and Raspberry Pis, doing um, uh, AR apps and and basic I iOS apps, creating banner ads, motion graphics. So it's everything that falls into this uh, creative coding uh, technology world. That's that's sort of my domain, and about. Three years ago, I told my um, creative director, we should get into this VR thing. It's going to be a big deal. And he was like, sure, yeah, let's do it. And um, I said, well, we should create a project and use that as, as sort of a proof of concept, as a prototype. And I proposed this project about pack once. And so for our company, they were very generous. They gave me time. They gave me resources to develop this project. Um, I spent two years working on the project at Fallon. And no one ever said, you know, hurry up. We want, want to see results. For them, it was really about the exploration and what we can do. And once they saw, wow, this is a pretty cool story, um, that's when we started going out and reaching out and spending money on, on promoting it. Um, but I was born, even though my name doesn't sound very Latvian, I was um, raised in a Latvian community in Toronto, Canada. And um, I first heard about the, the story of Pat once when I was 16 years old. 
and have wanted to find a way to tell their story basically since I was 16. But it doesn't really lend itself to documentary films, straight, straight documentary films, because you really need to get a sense of the space they lived in. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Am I talking about them? Good. Um, you really need to get a sense of that space they were living in. And once I started uh, playing around with VR, then I realized this, this is a great way to capture the space they inhabited. Which, on the one side, when I started traveling to the Soviet Union in, in the mid-80s, for someone from, you know, who's raised in Canada, it seemed like a very oppressive space, a very gray space, a very unfriendly space. But on the other side, the Soviet Union, or at least Riga, in the 1980s was also one of the most creative spaces. Everyone was asking very basic questions about what is art, what is democracy, almost these child, childlike questions, and there was this do it, your, they, they just want, wanted to break everything that came before them and create something new. And it was very vibrant, you know, so it, this juxtaposition of this oppressive environment, gray environment, with this very colorful creativity is something I wanted to capture, and I thought VR would be the way um, to capture that. Um, Kind of uh, the Cliff Notes version of Story of the Band. Um, they started in 1991, 1990, 1981, and they had a very, all their songs were, had basically one subject, which was live the truth in an untrue time. And to unpack that statement, what that meant for them was in the Soviet Union, um, your survival depended on pretending to be a loyal Soviet subject. Um, outwardly, you know, you joined the party uh, or um, you, you went to May Day parades, you maybe wore, wore a pin, so it was, there was certain pageantry to Soviet everyday life. But on the inside, everyone knew that this is all a lie, that the systems uh, corrupt, um, that it's falling apart, and um, amongst your very closest friends, you would talk about that and complain about it. And so everyone lived this, this sort of double life. And, but there was an agreement, in, at least in, in Soviet Latvia, there was an agreement from the government. Just pretend that you believe and we'll feed you, and we'll clothe you, and we'll educate you, and you know we'll just let this 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 theatrical presentation of Soviet life continue, and um, that live the truth in an untrue time. Yudis Kolokov, the founder of the band Patkon, just said, "Why does it have to be like this? Why can't we just be ourselves?" and stop pretending to be these two people. And this kind of, this, this picture of painting, I think, illustrates that sort of, that false utopia, that fake reality that um, the Soviet Union tried to create. Um, you know, two young people at the market, everyone's happy. Um, it isn't, you know, there's even, it's, it, it's, I guess you could call it a propaganda, and there's even a, propaganda within the propaganda painting up in the right hand corner but the reality of that market is it was busy it was everyone was in a bad mood people were scrambling around to get food stuffs so they kind of created this sort of false false reality on top of you know the actual reality and and your role as a soviet citizen was to at least pretend to buy into it. They, had, they by by the 1980s, people had, the regime had stopped asking people to actually believe in it, um, and so the the band started in 1981 with this message of live the truth in in an untrue time, and um, they were all classically trained musicians who were just fed up uh, with you know, the kind of music they were making, the kind of music that was surrounding them. So they started this band, and really in a do-it-yourself kind of spirit. 
made instruments themselves, made their own PA system themselves. And um, their concerts were um, just, people call them carnivals. They, they were just, and um, a few months ago, a Latvian writer called Mora Ikstena was visiting and she saw the VR film. And at a reading a few days later, she spoke about her memories of the band and growing up in Latvia. And she said, it was in those Patwan's concerts that she felt free for the first time in her life. And every time she returned to those concerts, she felt free. And all of her friends and everyone around her, it was they felt the sense of freedom for the first time. And she says, and because we knew what finally knew what freedom felt like, we knew we could make that freedom into a reality in the rest of society. So the people, when we say in, in our trailer the, with the provocative statement that the Soviet Union was not just pushed, uh, did not just fall, it was pushed by a band from Latvia. We're saying that from the spot that the people who led the revolution in Soviet Latvia for independence, those people experienced freedom for the first time in Pat One's concerts. And Mikhail, Mikhail Gorbachev has said that the fall of the Soviet Union started in the Baltic states. You know, you could make, you could make the case that the fall of the Soviet Union started in these concerts. And, and you can see in this photo, like, I mean, they're teenagers. They're early 20 year olds. You can see that I'm free, I can sing, I can dance, I can throw chairs, you know. You, you can see that, that this sort of breaking out. Um, and at the end of 1981-ish, um, the, after a concert, Yuris Kolokovs, the leader of the band, was called into the Ministry of Culture and was issued a ban. They were, the, the Minister of Culture said to him, the circus is over. Um, you're banned from recording anything, you're banned from uh, performing, um, they kicked him out of the music conservatory to boot. Um, the other, the lead singer was also kicked out of the music, her music conservatory. And um, they had nothing to do. But um, Pat once being Pat once, they weren't going to let a little thing like an official government ban stop them. So what they did is they set up um, a studio a do-it-yourself uh, recording studio in the lead singer's mom's house. And this is the house in the living room. The mom said, you know, just lock up after midnight, you know. And um, they, they found equipment. Um, they had a very talented sound engineer that managed to, out of found parts, create a four-track studio. And they recorded their first um, album, or better said, tape. And they just made, um, and this is a photo from like the living room where they're recording one of the guitar tracks. Um, and they just made uh, copies of tapes, and gave them to friends. Friends made copies of those tapes, gave them to more friends. And pretty soon, within a few months, everyone in Latvia had a cassette of their music. So this. This band that was meant to silence them actually made them louder because they had nothing to do. If they would have, if it weren't for the, Yuris Kolokov says, if it weren't for the band, they would have kept doing concerts. They probably never would have recorded their own music. So they actually did, this band did the band a huge favor. Um, and in around 1985, in the summer of 1985, the band was never lifted but it wasn't being enforced anymore. So they started touring the country again. Um, in the summer, they did a concert in the city of Wagra, which is about 40 kilometers south of Riga. And most of the concert goers here also, you can see that just joy and just wanting to break free and the, the power of that, that music is having on them. Um, most of the people at that concert had traveled to the concert by train from Riga. So about 5,000 people were at the concert. Uh, it was a sunny day. 
people had a good time. And after the show, they took a commuter train back to Riga. A riot. People were singing Pac-1 songs on the commuter train, and a sort of mini riot broke out. Um, lamps were smashed, benches were demolished, and about 5,000 rubles worth of damage was done to the train. Um, the Soviet criminal justice system rounded up 13 people to send them a message. And this is a shot from the trial where the kids, and when I say kids, they were, we're talking 14 year olds. Um, and this, this young man who was 18, the only of the 13 people who were put on trial, he was the only one who was over 18. He was sentenced to three years in a hard labor camp. Um, just to send a message to Yudas, if you keep making music, this is what's going to happen to people. Um, he was basically ruined for life. He's a young 18-year-old kid living with hardened criminals in a hard labor camp. And um, he's been um, off the grid ever since. Um, and... Um, Pack once was banned again. They were given a, not just a, a, a ban from performing, but they were also given a work ban. Um, they couldn't even um, they couldn't even get a job at a coffee shop, and um, the Soviet regime was just basically trying to starve them out. Um, Yudis was called into um, the ministry, the the communist ministry of propaganda. Um, the Central Committee's propaganda department, and basically told to leave the country, which is, I mean, for a Soviet citizen, which was an amazing offer, what, I can stay here and risk going to Siberia, or I can leave this place? And Yudas said, I'm staying. I'm not leaving. This is where I make my music. And he stayed. And um, after that meeting, what happened after that was, it just so happened that a documentary filmmaker, Yudas Podniks, was at that concert and shot the concert. And afterwards, he um, shot the trial and made a documentary film out of that called um, Is It Easy to Be Young, which is on YouTube. And it became one of the first perestroika films of the Gorbachev era and made Pak One's story known throughout the Soviet Union. And this, the, the film really reveals the hypocrisy of the Soviet criminal justice system. Um, and it was, it was, I think for a lot of people it was like, okay, if I'm pretending to be loyal to the regime, I can deal with it, but what the F are we doing to our kids? We're sending them away to Siberia, to a, he didn't go to Siberia, but a hard labor camp for three years and destroying his brain for life, just to make a point. And um, it really got things moving, especially in Latvia. And this is in the entire Soviet Union that that film was distributed. Um, and then it was after that, um, the independence movement slowly started and Pak once was really, a, an inspiration in that independence movement. This is a photo taken of the band's lead singer playing at the first mass demonstration in the Soviet Union, where I think about 100,000 people were in attendance. And um, everyone who was there says they remember her singing this song. That was like the thing they remember the most. Um, Throughout the 80s and into the early 90s, the independence movement slowly is gaining steam. Um, when it becomes obvious to Moscow that uh, Latvia is going to separate from the Soviet Union, um, they send in OMON, which were paramilitary special forces units, to attack strategic points in Lithuania. 17 people were killed in those attacks on the first day. It was after the attacks in Lithuania that Latvians kind of just scrambled to form human shields around vulnerable targets. And this is one of the, basically, the outposts where people said, without guns, just saying, okay, you can attack us, but you have to go through us. And Pat once played at the barricades day and night. 
um, simply to keep people awake, just saying, keep going, we're here, we'll play music, we'll entertain you, but um, this is important. And it was a 13-day standoff, and after that, Moscow uh, retreated, and the paramilitary forces were sent back. Uh, in the summer of that month, um, in, that, in the summer of 1991, Moscow did send in the tanks, and people took to the streets again, and this time they took down the Soviet Union with them. Um, and so that's the Cliff Notes version of the story, but how do you turn that story into a virtual reality film? So I went to Latvia together with my wife to, um, we, we shot interviews with the band, and using uh, depth kit, with using a depth kit system, we, we decided not to use depth kit, but we kept the audio interviews. Um, and, but the most valuable thing we got from the band was just a stack of photos. And that was basically all the material we had. So at the agency, we, we, we laid out the, the photos, the archival photos and some initial designs out into sort of a storyboard and about the art directors at the agency could come in and say, oh, could I design something for this? Could I do something for this? Um, and the thing we kind of latched on to, that the place we kept looking for inspiration was in this particular magazine called Avwats, which was a 1980s Soviet Latvian magazine that had this sort of de do-it-yourself sort of style. Everything looks like cut up and splattered, but very designed at the same time. And we use that as sort of our, our visual inspiration guide that kind of linked back to the do-it-yourself spirit of pack ones. Oh, we're banned? We'll just make the studio ourselves. We'll, um, you know, there are stories of how they would uh, break into pay phones to steal uh, the magnets in pay, pay phones because they could use them as pickups and stuff like that. I don't know whether the band did that, but they, 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 they go into great detail about how they created their equipment, which was kind of ingenious. Um, and this, this, this love of you know just taking one thing, putting it together, and what's another sound we can create. So we use this magazine as, as, as sort of our visual spirit animal. Um, and um, kind of created this thing called do-it-yourself VR, um, which seemed to kind of tell the story, seemed to do the band more justice than if we would have tried to do a uh, photorealistic representation of the band. Um, but also combining it with um, taking objects from the Soviet Union that seemed very emblematic and they're going into deep detail of like how is this created, how do roughness, how, how do roughness, roughness maps work, how does uh, light uh, bounce off this, this, this metal and, and, and kind of like in these like minute objects kind of tr trying to capture the essence of that. Um, so yeah, so one of the things we did is, um, this is from one of the first scenes of the movie when we go into it. Um, we recreated, we looked at old uh, photo albums and recreated Soviet brutalist architecture and created this sort of utopian space as, envis as envisaged by social realism. Like this kind of, this actual space doesn't exist anywhere. It was just kind of like a collage of all these different socialistic spaces that we put into one. And then um, juxtapose that with these do-it-yourself like collages of the band, archival material coming at you. Um, also in this sort of cutout style like from the magazine. Uh, instead of trying to do, um, uh, you know, modeled rigs of the band talking to you. Um, 
And then we went to the band to, to we went to, this is Yodis Kolokov's in, at his, um, in his um, office. And um, we went there to scan some photos. And um, he started pulling out his old musical notes. And being a classically trained musician, um, they, the way their practices, rehearsals would work, is he would hand out musical notes to the band, and they'd read the musical notes. And, um, and it's from those readings that they would go, oh, this is good, this is good, and then they'd start playing. Um, and we started looking at those musical notes, and my wife had the idea, we should just scan them. So we scan these musical notes, and I can't read music, but this, just his handwriting and the way he writes just seems incredibly beautiful. And so we scanned about uh, 50 of his songs. Um, you know, you can almost see him thinking here, you know. Um, and we scanned about 50 of his songs, and we used those uh, musical notes as textures to create spaces, um, which I thought was really kind of cool. It gave it this, this quality to it. And then layered on top of those uh, musical note textures, 3D objects, and um, archival photos. Um, and then there was another happy coincidence that uh, the Lat in the Latvian National Archives, the, the Latvian National Archives basically when a photographer dies, they um, just are given all of that photographer's material. So they have masses and masses of material that they don't have the resources to process it with. And we found a box of photos, of photo negatives, labeled Patek Once. So that's all they knew, is that this was from a Patek Once concert. And this is from a the archivist taking them out and developing these negatives. So no one knew what it was, what all these negatives were. And it turned out that there were 500 photos from that concert in Lugra, after which the riot broke out. And that one, um, uh, that one young man was uh, sent to a hard labor camp for. And, and so it was taken from various different perspectives. So we could, it took us a while to figure out what to do with all, we knew we had to do something with these photos, but we didn't know what. And what we ended up doing is cutting them out in a collage style, and we could create like a 360 of that concert, which is very abstract. And we have the, 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 the cutouts um, animating to uh, the bass rhythm of the song you're hearing at that moment, which I thought was, and it, even though it's very abstract and very collagey, especially when you're watching it in the vibe, it kind of gives you the sense that you're in a concert kind of crowded around in a sort of a confined space that you don't have a complete viewing area. And in the vibe, you can jump up and then see the band on the stage as you would in a concert. Um, and as I mentioned before, for me, the, the, the main reason for, for doing it in VR was um, space and, and telling this band's story through uh, various, through nine different spaces, the Ministry of Culture, through um, the, the, the living room where they recorded their first albums, through... Um, uh, the, the Communist Party uh, office where he was asked to leave the country. And this space is we recreated the uh, um, Cathedral Square in Riga and then uh, mapped newspaper articles uh, from the barricades, international newspaper art articles, and um, then had the band standing in the middle. And trying to capture the essence of that space, not just as a photo real, photorealistic representation of it, but a more abstract representation. And in the horizon, you see those Soviet paramilitary troops, kind of like that threat of always being there. 
Um, and that barrel is, is that barrel of fire is kind of iconic for the barricades, is that people had rolled out these barrels and were basically burning wood in there uh, day and night for 13 days. Um, and in Latvia, 13 people died mm -hmm. during, during the standoff, and most of them camera people. Um, and, and then, so we were, we spent, as I mentioned, we start, I started about two years ago, and then somewhere along while we were making it, um, this, this weird thing happened, and uh, Donald Trump was elected president. And it was like, we kind of saw the parallels between the sort of fake news and alternative facts in the Soviet Union, but it took us a while to realize that this isn't, this story is incredibly relevant today um, in this sort of fake reality, alternate reality that's, that's being created. And we weren't sure, quite sure how, but we, we knew we had to explore this. So we went back and we started recreating um, the entire script and, and, and reworking our story to kind of blend it into the stories that are happening today. Not, not in a heavy hammered kind of way, but in a um, kind of more subtle, like there are parallels, there are, there are relevancies to what's happening now. And it's only at the end we start in that sort of Soviet utopian kind of world and we end in that Soviet utopian kind of world, but it's changed. We have um, the first remnants of capitalism just being plastered on top of it and this tower of television sets with this new reality. Um, and when I showed this and I think when I showed this to uh, American audiences for the first time, they automatically got the, oh yeah, they saw the parallels and that this final scene um, was relevant. When I showed it in Latvia to people for the first time, they were offended. And they were like, who are you to come in and say that our society is like this? And um, so when we did um, the, the, and this is showing it to Latvian audiences in it, so it wasn't their first language. So when we redid, uh, when we did the Latvian voiceover of it, we, we changed the ending in Latvian to say, basically, this isn't a story about you anymore. This is a story about us. And just so it's clear to them, we're not some Americans coming in telling you what your society is like right now. Um, and... And then so in, in May of last year, we, um, we, were, we were done. And we were, uh, wanted to do our opening. Uh, and we were invited to a, um, to a um, small VR film festival at uh, Viva Tech, which is in Paris. And Viva Tech has sort of a VR park in it, which is sponsored by Alibaba. And we were excited, we're getting ready to go, and then we um, get a note from the festival organizers is that, that um, they showed the film to Alibaba and they do not want us to participate in their festival. And it was, you know, and um, it, was, it, was, it was kind of heart-wrenching, like, what's what's going on here like i mean this is like 35 years after the fall of communism and we're getting we're not being allowed to show this film about the band and um you know our pr person at the time said this is like a gift from the pr gods <laughs> but we decided not to make a big pr fuss about it and i think rightfully so because I think Alibaba had never encountered censorship before. Like they, so the way it probably went is they had to give this to someone and then that third party said, no, you can't show that film. So they were in an uncomfortable situation. The festival organizers were in an uncomfortable situation. 
Um, our parent company has chi Chinese clients, Huawei. And, and so we decided to keep it quiet. Um, the band, unfortunately, didn't get that message. And they gave it to um, the press. And this is, um, my wife came down one night and saw it on Facebook. That um, the thing was, this was on, and this was all over the Latvian news. And this is them talking about it. And that's the lead singer. The band has two lead singers, a female and a male. This is the male lead singer at I'm Once Bacevitz. And he si he's talking about the, the, the band at Vivotech. And he said, let them ban it. Who cares? Rock and roll is freedom, and freedom will always win. Which I thought was incredibly profound coming from him. He also said nothing's changed in 35 years. <laughs> it's, it's like we've been banned twice, third time, whatever. Anyways, but what happened was um, our, our sister agency, Marcel, in um, Paris, uh, said, well, we've got a booth. You can just come show it here with us. So off we went to, to Paris and showed it anyways at the same festival. Just, you know, like a few like, exhibition booths down. Um, and this was our opening at Viva Tech in Paris at the Marcel booth. And it was an incredibly moving, because it was the first time we'd shown it to the public and just seeing like how strongly people were reacting to it, especially the, the resonances with um, the current political situation. Um, then we went to Latvia and showed it to the band, which this was the most terrifying experience of my life, was showing it to the band for the first time because they'd never, they hadn't seen it, there was no way to show it to them. And it was, Raim once, when he first saw it, he just, um, we had cameras there, we're filming his reaction, and he was, he just left the room. He just was like, get out of my face. And I was, me being an American, oh my gosh, oh, he hates it, you know. Um, he needed to process. And then it was afterwards he started talking and he said it was like, he said it was like I was in a dream, dreaming, I was in, it was like I was in someone else's dream who was dreaming about me. Mm -hmm. And he said it was through the abstractness of that do-it-yourself nature, it was like those were kind of the triggers that brought him back into the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, that he thought he was there again. Um, it wasn't through the photorealism. It was like those small triggers. Yes, I'm back there. And all, that's what all the band members kept saying was. And, and people, so when we started showing it in Latvia with the Oculus Goes, it was like a lot of people like crying because mm -hmm. they were triggered back into that past right away. And with Oculus Goes, they're so hard to clean. And after so many people crying, they, they kind of got <laughs> gross. Um, but we got them cleaned. Um, and um, yeah, and then after that, we were, we were like, OK, do we want to wait to show this at film festivals, or do we want to create our own film festivals? So we decided to go a strategy of, we're just going to create our own events. And we created events that were multi-tiered, like at art galleries. This is from the Walker Art Center. Um, and then we took it to Latvia. This was on Latvian television where the anchor of this morning show put on the headset and started walking around <laughs> on live TV. And he's bumping into everything, commenting. It was hilarious. But you could see like his joy, like, wow, experiencing VR for the first time and at the same time a story that's very relevant to him. And then he bonked into the screens and the set, which is really funny. And then afterwards, once the segment was done, it was like everyone in the studio was passing around the VR headset. Oh, I want to see. And then, and then well, during the commercial break, it was super fun and cute. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, and then doing small community events. Mm -hmm. um, this is from uh, last Saturday, where we showed it uh, to uh, Latvian school kids here in Boston. Um, and through this sort of like, and we've done churches, we've done uh, bars, we've, you know, film festivals, and through this sort of multi-tiered approach, we've been able to show this to about a thousand people without going through the Oculus store. Um, and then we went to Riga, 
And the band was so excited, they said, let's do a concert and a screening of the film. <laughs> so we got 20 headsets, which was really hard managing 20 Oculus headsets at once. Um, and the band did a show. And it was like this combination of live music and, and VR was spectacular. Um, we were expecting about 50 people at the event and 300 showed up and they were mad because they wanted to see and we only had 20 headsets and they were getting pretty rowdy. Um, and then I got up on stage and um, said, um, and I said, we're gonna stay here until every last person has seen this, who wants to see it. And at one in the morning, we wrapped up, we showed the last person. It was, mad. It was a beautiful night, it was outside, it was so nice. Anyways, and then we did an event with uh, Rolling Stone, and they said, yeah, let's, let's, let's help you put on an event here in, um, in New York City. Um, this is on the left, this is Corey Groh, um, who's an editor at Rolling Stone. He moderated uh, a discussion with myself and Ieva Akurata. Um, he was so enamored with Ieva, I think. It was like, and she was like such a, um, she sang afterwards and everyone was, was had goosebumps from her. She just um, is an amazing uh, stage presence. Um, yeah, this is her singing at the event with Rolling Stone. And um, so I thought there'd be more students here. So we, so being from an ad agency, um, we um, are entering, we, one of the things ad agencies do is they make case study videos so they can then um, submit the, their work to things like award shows, show it to clients. Um, this is a case study video that, we, that um, my creative director, Patrick Figueroa, made um, about um, the project we did. Um, and I'll show it to you. This is a case study of when an advertising agency in middle America decided to make a virtual reality documentary about a 1980s Latvian rock band. It all started when this guy, Hi, I'm Corey McLeod, decided to do a passion project in an unlikely medium. Corey, as you may or may not have guessed, is Latvian. And like most Latvians, he grew up listening to Patrons. And like most Latvians listening to Patrons, he knew their legendary story well. In Soviet-occupied Latvia, your survival depended on pretending to be loyal to the regime. But in 1981, this band comes along with homemade guitars and hard rock sound. And it made people feel free for the first time ever. Bath once was banned twice, and their fans put on trial. But the harder the regime tried to stop them, the more powerful their music became. And then it all tipped over. This is a story of homemade guitars beating Soviet guns. Was it necessary to tell the story in virtual reality? Is this story relevant today? Alternative facts. Alternative facts. Fake news. Fake news. Fake, 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 fake news. And why did an ad agency decide to tell us? We don't know, we just did. Sometimes a story needs to be told just so that it can stay alive. So yeah, that's our um, case study. And I think that what's interesting about that case study is that um, coming from an advertising agency that solves business problems, you know? Um, if we're not solving a problem, then we're not doing our job correctly. And creating uh, an art piece, you know, for artists, like most of you probably creators here in the room, no, it's a good story. That's, that's why you tell it, right? That isn't an answer enough, and we turned, I like how 
Patrick turn that not knowing into the product itself and commoditizing. Um, and I mean, that's, that's it. So thanks for listening and thanks for being here. Um, I've got time. I think we have time for some questions. I also have two headsets here if anyone wants to check it out. Um, it's on, on the Oculus Go, so it's not as great as on the Vive, but it's 11 minutes long, and check it out, hang out. Any questions? Is it available anywhere other than through you? Not right now, so we're still trying to figure that part out. Um, there's a lot of, so we did it purely as a pro bono project, and, and with that, um, you know, we don't even know who owns the rights to a lot of the material. Um, not who owns the rights, but we don't know who took a lot of these photos. And, and so we're trying to get that piece of the puzzle figured out before we release it to the public. But we hope we'll get that sorted out in the next few months. We do have a copy of it at the Public VR Lab yeah. if, if folks associated with the Open Doc Lab and MIT want to come over and check it out inside the vibe. And we can we can send it to you guys and so it's available here too if people want to check it out. Any other questions? Um, the one that most immediately comes to mind is um, what does this make you want to do next? Um, well, I mean, a passion of mine has always been telling using technology to tell stories about Latvia. Um, and a few years ago, I created um, a, a virtual tour of the Riga ghetto during the Holocaust um, using archival material from the Shoah Foundation. And, um, and I think that the next project I'd like to do is a continuation of the Holocaust story in, in Latvia, but doing it about a, um, a man who, uh, who saved the lives of 50 people uh, during the Holocaust in Latvia. In, in VR again? With the, I think in VR or in mixed reality. The archival material as I still, I'm still in the early stages of, of working on this project, but I think it would probably be something similar. That's you what were I mean. synthesizing the environment, did you do it in 2D or 3D? Sorry, what's that? Since you were creating these synthetic environments, were they 2D or 3D? So, um, both. That's why we call this a two point virtual That's reality in 2.5D. Um, so a lot of the stuff was CG. The environments were CG, 3D environments. Um, but a lot of the archival material were 2D materials that were brought in. And then using like animation, some of it being you know timeline based animation, other animations being uh, coded animations. So depending on where you're looking at the space, so the environment changes depending on where you're looking. Um, that that lights go on at different times. So and also emulating in, in the Soviet Union spaces never felt static. It always felt as though the spaces were looking at you. Um, <clears throat> so we want to capture that through interactivity. I just want to ask how big was the team that created the film? So it was basically me. Um, <laughs> along with, so we had that wall and um, so designers could come in and say, um, oh, I've got a few days free, I'd like to design something for this. Um, a few editors helped us out make uh, the, the trailers we saw in that case study video. Uh, someone helped us make the logo, so about 20 people in general helped out with the project. And then we had two interns who helped with 3D modeling from the art institutes in Minneapolis. So, money said this idea, Was it a case study of what happens when an agency does a project like this? Was it a case study about telling these kind of stories in VR? Was it? It was a case study of um, uh, an ad agency doing a story and what about were the a Soviet. 
Um, and the conclusion of that case study video is that um, we don't know why we created this. As sort of like a business problem, we're not solving a business problem. What we're doing is just telling a story because it's important. As creative people, we should be, you know, as you know, our agents. If our agency believes in the power of creativity to change, yeah, instigate there change, there doesn't have to be a reason. Yeah. But I think it also speaks to the. I mean, just the the that creativity and art creates change. I mean, it, I think yeah. the whole subject matter is so powerful, it so powerfully yeah. speaks to that, you know, that that just by creating a sense of freedom in one moment, that that can have this mm -hmm. ripple effect, and and also also true in VR too, which mm -hmm. I think is kind of beautiful right. about this project that you can create this one moment where maybe everything shifts for you because you have a physical understanding mm -hmm. of of that freedom or sense of whatever it is you're trying to convey. Interesting too that you didn't separate yourself from your identity as working in that business. You know that that's what you should be doing, and that this mm. wasn't a separate project. Mm. That was no, it was very much a, a work project yeah. that supported. And you know, saying that about Fallon uh, has always had a very um, big. Uh, pro bono spirit, like one of our clients has always been the Children's Defense Fund, uh -huh. which we've had since um, the mid 80s. And as some of you may remember from the 80s, those posters of, um, uh, there's one poster that's still in the Congress luncheon room where you see a baby uh, crawling away from the camera and there's a target on the baby's diaper and it says when Congress starts thinking about funding, who do they hit first? Mm -hmm. And that poster is still up in Congress to remind Congress people that we need to always think about children. And um, if I may brag about Fat Pat Fallon um, a bit, it was um, one of the things the Children's Defense Fund has done is help teenage moms. And uh, we were our agency was pitching Domino's Pizza. And I don't know whether it's still the case, but the CEO at the time was um, indicated that he would like to award Fallon uh, his business uh, if they dropped the Children's Defense Fund as a client. And Pat Fallon said, I'm not going to stop uh, helping the Children's Defense Fund to sell more pizzas. And, and they didn't accept the account. And at a time when Fallon was needed that client. So are there other kinds of projects that you have in mind? Sorry, to circle back, you said before that you, you had recorded the original interviews with Death Kid mm -hmm. and then decided not to use them. What was the reason why you made that decision? Well, I think that the depth kit footage had a certain look and feel that just didn't, you know, when we, once we got all the archival material, we realized this is our pot of gold. And, um, and we just couldn't get the depth kit footage to kind of gel with the archival footage. You know, um, it, it kind of felt, the depth kit footage felt very, futuristic um, and, and it just didn't gel with the sort of do-it-yourself archival that sort of raw energy that, that, that the photos had which was the prime reason we've had some frustration with that kit because it takes a really long time and a lot of processing power and we're yeah it's huge I know we're excited at the lab to see what the new Structure I.O. when it comes out this month is going to look like and whether it would be possible, more possible to use that more easily. But we'll see. And it's also, and the other reason was that once we looked at it, you know, which is always the problem when you're doing a project <laughs> across continents, that it would have been great to go, oh, let's go back and retry it another way. And that just wasn't financially possible for us. Any other questions? No? 
Well, thanks for coming and thanks for listening, guys. If someone wants to check it out, you know. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great.